Good morning birdners, I've got the best possible start for the week. We are birding again and even better we are doing it here at Lilypan. Uh, I know it's a favourite spot for many of you just a kilometre or so from the house. Not only stunning and scenic but obviously a great place to search for our birds. Um, now if you are feeling a little overwhelmed by the mention of all those hundreds of birds last week and wonder how on earth you're ever going to tell the difference between all of them then hopefully we're gonna to start to make that a little bit easier from today uh, because we're just gonna concentrate on a specific group and that's those found at the water. So just scanning across our pan here, this is almost like a cheat sheet way of birding uh, to select a specific habitat. And it could be anything from an open grassland, maybe a river system. This morning we're doing the pan. Uh, and while a lot of birds um, will visit this pan throughout the day to drink, doves are a good example, they very reliant on water, they'll drink consistently every morning and late afternoon. Uh, there's only some birds which will be here full time. So by spending time in these habitats and getting to know those birds, uh, we can imme immediately make our job of bird ID easier uh, because we know once we get to a water body, exactly the species that we can expect to find. In fact, if you have been to Ascari before, you must pause your video now, <laughs> write yourself a list. Here you are at Lily Pan. What do you expect for us to see this morning? No visit to a waterhole would be complete without a pair of Egyptian geese. Now, a lot of bird species are what we call monogamous. That means that they pair for life and the Egyptian goose is a good example of this. Generally, in monogamous species, there's very little sexual dimorphism, meaning the male and female look very similar. Uh, in other species, the males are very colorful, very elaborate, huge feathers to impress the females. Uh, the Egyptian geese don't waste time with that. They just spend time forming bonds. They're very successful. Uh, you'll generally, like I say, find one at every water source you go to. They're highly territorial uh, and they're not very fussy nesters, which is part of their success. They'll pretty much nest anywhere. <clears throat> and they have precocial young, which means that the young already have a downy feathers. Uh, their eyes open and can even leave the nest as quickly as six hours after being born. So very successful breeders as well. Okay, here we have an African darter, and this one's identified by the very long straight neck and also a very long straight beak. Uh, they can be confused with the cormorants, but the cormorants have a hook on their beak, unlike this one, which is completely straight. Uh, and they use this for fishing, almost uh, in like a, a spear motion with which they impale the fish with their beak there. Now in Afrikaans, uh, the name for this bird translates to snake bird. And that relates to what they look like when they're actually in the water. So when they're swimming, uh, a lot of their body is actually underneath the water. It's not visible. And so all you see is that long neck and head above the surface, which does make it look a little bit like a snake moving through the water. Now that's because uh, the darters and the cormorants, they have a lot less preen oil on their feathers than other birds. Uh, the preen oil is what waterproofs feathers, it also makes them more buoyant, but they don't want to be too buoyant uh, because obviously they need to dive underneath to catch fish. Oh, I'm just gonna demonstrate that for us. There we go, perfectly. <laughs> Looks like a snake traveling through the water there. Here's one of our cormorants. Uh, this is a reed cormorant. This is a freshwater species so found in dams and rivers, very common to see. And just as I was exp as explaining, um, the same as the data, they have a reduced amount of preen oil, which aids them in their hunting technique, diving under the water to catch fish. They'll also swallow stones to help them with that, and that gives them a little bit of extra weight. Uh, and they can stay underwater for more than a minute at a time whilst searching for fish. Uh, it does mean that they don't dry off um, very successfully with their lack of preen oil. So you'll often see them sitting on the branch with their wings spread out 
uh, using the air and the sun to dry instead. Here's that cormorant again, uh, just had a successful fishing trip. Looks like maybe a little tilapia or something that it's caught there. This has to be one of my favourite birds to see at Lilypan. This is a Malachite kingfisher. So we have 10 species of kingfisher in southern Africa and in fact you can see nine of those here in the low felt and on Pidwa. The only one we're missing is a mangrove king, king, kingfisher. Uh, we don't have the right habitat for them. Uh, this is definitely one of the smaller ones. They're about 14 centimetres fully grown. And it's also one of the few kingfishers that actually eats fish. So they don't all eat fish, a lot of them eat insects. Um, but being a piscivore, this one is always found close to water. It also means that it's with us all year round because while insect populations can vary throughout the summer and winter, the fish are always here. Now the stunning blue colours on the kingfishers are actually quite misleading. They don't have any blue pigment in their feathers whatsoever. It's actually caused by something called Tyndall scattering. Uh, the feathers are made up of keratin and those different layers of keratin interspersed with air spaces reflect uh, specific wavelengths which give us the blue colour. And that Malachite kingfisher has just come a little bit closer to us here. There you can see that beautiful blue on the back. Hard to believe there's actually no blue pigment in there. Here's our cormorant again, just demonstrating what I was mentioning earlier, um, holding out the wings to dry. And then just on the right of it there is the African data that we looked at earlier. So not strictly a water bird, but you'll remember I mentioned doves uh, using the water. And this is a Cape turtle dove just having a bath here. So they do this mostly for cleaning purposes, but also to cool down. Um, but you'll see it's not going all the way into the water. It's just having a careful balance of which feathers get wet um, so that it doesn't become too heavy and waterlogged and that it can escape quickly if it needs to. Okay, then this dove's just come to the branch here and they'll often perch afterwards so they can reapply preen oil uh, and and spread that out onto the feathers after bathing. Now this is a great find. This is a black crake. Uh, the crakes are normally quite secretive and hard to see, um, but they generally make a lot of noise. So you do often know that they're around. Now the first thing you might be thinking is that this one doesn't look very black. And actually um, that's because it's a juvenile. So the adult is very black in colour, a bright yellow stunning beak and red legs and red feet. But because this is a juvenile, everything that I've just described is just a little bit duller um, in those different categories. Now the black crake is omnivorous, it eats literally almost anything um, from tadpoles, fish, worms, snails, even the nestlings of bird maybe um, weaver birds that fall into the water and you'll see that it's assisted um, in its feeding habits by these absolutely huge feet long long toes which allow them uh, to walk around the water's edge but also completely across the water as well those long toes allowing them to balance on the lily pads and on the vegetation just under the water too Okay, it's just starting to quieten down at the pan, so we'll leave it there for today. Uh, but we've made a really good start on the water birds there, and so hopefully that's a little bit easier now. Next time we come to water, you can immediately narrow it down, cancel out a lot of birds, um, because we know more what type of bird we're looking for. Uh, let me know how your list went in the comments. Uh, how many of those species that we saw this morning did you predict successfully? Uh, maybe even some that were missing. Let us know those as well. 
then we'll know what to look out for next time we come to Lilypan.